It's very difficult, especially when someone's making us feel like we're overreacting, to get impartial. Where is the line between me asking too much and me asking for the right amount? You have to see dating much like you see interviewing for a job. You are hiring for the most important position on earth. And that position is for your life mate. They've created an expectation in their mind for what this could be. Instead of watching a story unfold, we've created the story before it's happened. We created a story that hasn't been earned yet. Life can be complicated and sometimes people will come up with all sorts of logical reasons why they can't invest right now, why they need to take a break, why they, you know, whatever logistical difficulties there are in the two of you being together, you're far apart, you, that person runs their own business and they haven't got much time, whatever it may be. They may be giving you logically sound reasons as to why it's they're not able to give you what you want or why they would be doing this, but... And then what happens is people get entangled in all of that logic. And I think the way to simplify that and make it uncomplicated is simply to say, whether or not this logic is true is not for me to figure out. So many women take on the problem. You tell me it can't work out because of these reasons. And I see a problem to solve. So they'll go, oh, you're, so you're saying that we can't be together because, of, because you're really busy with work. Well, listen, I could do this and you could do that and we could find time on weekends. We could, like they start trying to solve the problem. And part of that is because they've created an expectation in their mind for what this could be, right? They, we have a story. Story is very dangerous, mm -hmm. right? Because instead of watching in a relationship or dating scenario, instead of watching a story unfold, we've created the story before it's happened. People do this before they even get on a first date, right? They, they, you, you see some, someone asks you out, you start talking to someone and then you look them up on Instagram and, oh wow, oh, they're really cool. Oh, they're impressive. Oh, they seem nice too. Oh, they have family and they're close to those people and like they have a good life and wow, this is exactly the kind of person I want. I think you, me and this person could really have some. You haven't even been on a <laughs> date with them yet, right? So now what happens right. is our mind takes the 5% of what we know and uses it to build a story for the next 95%. So now how do, you get, how do we get so damaged, so hurt, so heartbroken so quickly? That's something that we're like, sometimes I think we shock ourselves. Think, Am I an insane person? I've been on one date with this person and I feel like I'm, an ex I'm experiencing a mini heartbreak because they didn't get back to me. Mm. What's happening here? What's happening is we created a story that hasn't been earned yet. Why do we do that though? Because we want it. On one hand, we want it. We want it to happen. We're a biased judge of the situation. We can't be trusted, right? We, we want it to happen. So we're trying to find any evidence for that story that we're looking to create. I want to find the love of my life. I want to see someone as perfect. I want to, so we're looking for evidence of that. So we start filling in the gaps. And our brains, it's not like we do this consciously. But our brains make so many calculations and we do it in the other direction too. We do it, you know, if, if we've got insecurities and someone goes out one night and they don't text us for an hour or two, who are they talking to? They're, talk they're at that party, you know, and, and I knew they were going to go to that party, but now that they've not texted me for a couple of hours, they're talking to someone attractive. I wonder if they're flirting. Maybe that, I think they're flirting. Two and a half hours, they still haven't texted me? What the hell? Now we start building up a, a, a story, right? And we create this reaction. I heard a beautiful thing the other day, which is if, it's, if the reaction is hysterical, then it's historical, <laughs> right? Then, then it comes from our trauma, our wounds, our history, the beliefs that have yes. accumulated over time. So now what we're reacting to is not the situation, but our past. The situation is simply the thing that aggravated our past. And now we create a story about the future based on that. So instead of going in with a curiosity, we go in with a conclusion. Ooh. So I need to slow down the story that's happening. This supercomputer is amazing, but it's also extremely dangerous because it is creating a story at a rate that is unbelievable. 
And the way that you slow down that story is that you start valuing a different thing. Instead of valuing potential, you start valuing the work that's actually happening in real time. There are, I always say there's four stages of importance in any relationship or potential relationship between two people. The first stage is just admiration, right? That's where I look at you, this person's beautiful, this person's intelligent, this person's, they've got all sorts of qualities that I really want in a person, admiration. Now that doesn't mean there's any kind of back and forth. By the way, you can have that for someone you've never met, mm -hmm. someone you saw online, right? But you have a level of admiration. That's the first stage of importance, clearly not very important. Although even there, people put a ton of importance on it. I found someone I like. <laughs> it's you so true. You found a person. Hmm. You found a person. But it isn't doesn't... it also good to be excited? You can be excited, okay. but about the right thing. You could be excited hmm. that you think someone's awesome, but not about what you have together yet because mm -hmm. you have nothing right. together. Right. So admiration is the first stage. The second stage is connection, or you could say connection, connection or chemistry, or both. That's where we have a kind of mutual admiration. There's some connection, there's some chemistry, there's something that's an exchange between us where we both feel something. Again, not very important because you can feel it with a lot of people and that it's no indicator of investment, right? It, that, and this is where people get real caught up Women tell me the most horrific stories about who a guy is, about how little he invests, about how much he's disrespectful. But we have such a great connection, Matt. Mm -hmm. Listen, our connection, like that's the thing. And they want me to buy into this idea that stage two is super important. But I don't, because I know it's not. The third stage is commitment. The third stage is there's admiration, there's mutual connection or chemistry, and there's a yes. You and I have actually said yes to each other. You wanna be with me? Yeah, I wanna be with you. Okay, we're doing this. Now there's an actual connect, uh, commitment. That's beautiful. Now we're into something important. But there's a fourth stage, and the fourth stage is compatibility. Beyond chemistry, beyond connection, beyond us both saying yes, there also needs to be compatibility in the way we want to live our lives, in the stage of our lives that we're in. Do they work? You know, you, you, this is why one of the reasons that relationships with, with big age gaps can struggle. They can work, but they also struggle because you've got two people often in very different stages of their lives. And there's a compatibility issue there, even though there's connection and chemistry, and even though they're both saying yes, now you have the problem of compatibility issues. Or you have the problem of compatibility issues because one person you know, their idea of a good time is going out and drinking every night of the week. And another person's idea is, you know, to go on hikes and to, you know, be healthy and to, they value the morning, the other person values the night. So now you have a compatibility issue. And there are many relationships that end not on the fact that they haven't said yes to each other, but on the fact that they're not compatible. And we always want to believe that, you know, love is all you need, right? <laughs> we want to believe that, that if we just love each other enough, but actually the many, many people have experienced in their lives, the cold hard truth is that you need two people who also work together. And so the reason I say all of this about these four stages, and to give you one more kind of metaphor for this, because it's important that, you know, when you meet someone on a date, that's like, that's like discovering that, and you both like each other, that's like discovering a great plot of land. It has potential, but there's nothing to mourn over right now. And when two people decide we're going to start investing, that's like two builders who start building a castle on that land. They start building whatever their castle is, you know, but they start building this amazing thing, this amazing investment on this land and it becomes theirs, it becomes ornate and unique and there are secret rooms no one else knows about and there are, you know, all these details that are the fabric and the colors and the textures of their relationship that makes it uniquely theirs, right? There's many ways to build, but this one is theirs. And that's what makes it special. People are not valuing the castle, they're valuing the connection. Mm -hmm. They're not valuing stages one through four together, they're valuing stage two or stage one. Just, I just admire this person or I just have a connection with this person. And when we start valuing the castle over the connection, 
we'll start unwinding the story that's gotten too far ahead because we'll realize that story we have on the date where our mind has gone way too far. And that's, by the way, why we get so nervous is because the story is already happening in our mind. And now we're getting nervous. On, why am I so nervous on this date? It's okay to have a little bit of nerves, but why am I like now paralyzed? <laughs> I can't be funny. I'm not charming. I'm not telling any interesting stories. I'm just frozen. Why am I that nervous? Because I've gone way into the future as if the castle's already been built, when actually all it is is a fantasy set of blueprints right now. So we have to talk about that new relationship energy because when we're in that space also, our brains are so love drunk, literally, <laughs> that we're not sure whether or not we're compatible with somebody. We actually may mistake that chemistry for compatibility, but compatibility is actually very different. And compatibility is about how do we line up in the areas of our lives in such a way that if you never changed and I never changed, we would still fit like a glove and we would both be happy and have our needs met in this relationship for the rest of our lives. So how do you then start to work on that compatibility for a long-term relationship? Mm -hmm. um, because there's going to be many elements. I call it like dust settling. So mm -hmm. let's say you're not compatible and you, you butt heads on something. It's like, well, okay, well, you still have a bit of the flutter, so you don't really address it. And so the dust kind of settles. And then a year yeah. goes by and you still don't really say anything. And that thing that you kind of thought was annoying, but you still love them for it now is just freaking annoying. Right. Um, and it starts to build up. And just like dust settling, it becomes so big. It's, you can't clean it anymore. Yeah, they're deal breakers. And it's so funny, you know, I just found this meme the other day that I shared with my husband and I said, this is how relationships work. And it said, you know, early in the relationship, when you're first lying together in bed at night, all you want to do is put your head on their chest and listen to their heartbeat. And that is the rhythm that rocks you to sleep. And then somewhere years later, you go, you know, I'm going to record you at night so you can hear how loud you're snoring because I want to kill you and I want you to know it too, right? Right. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's like that didn't happen overnight, right? It's right, not like you right. woke up one day and went, oh, yesterday I loved it and now he just freaking annoys me. So where's the gap? Because that's, yeah. I think, something that we people don't talk about enough, about how to avoid those exactly. little things that end up becoming like the biggest freaking splinter in your relationship. Yeah. And I say you have to learn these things so that you can avoid what I call a starter marriage, which is you marry for the wrong reasons. All of a sudden, somewhere down the road, years later, you find that this is not the relationship for you. And unfortunately, in order for both of you to be happy, you wind up having to leave and be with other people and take what you learned with you. So these are the tools and the lessons that we really need to learn in order to avoid the starter marriage. OK. And so what I like to tell people is when you are dating, that is the perfect time to really Really go slow and take stock. And you have to see dating much like you see interviewing for a job. So if you've ever been a supervisor or a manager, I want you to think about dating in the very same way because you are hiring for the most important position on earth. <laughs> and that position is for your life mate. And that's how we have to see dating. We have to look at the individuals that we are dating as potential candidates to fill this position instead of dating, thinking that this person is supposed to be our life mate. Mm. So unfortunately, we give boyfriends or girlfriends the husband or wife experience when we don't even know if we should be hiring them for that position. OK, so it's got to be like a test drive. So when we're first interviewing people, they're like candidates and you go, well, tell me about yourself. Well, tell me where you're from. And you're thinking about them within context of your employment. Right. In, in terms of the organization that you're thinking about having them come on board. You might like them and interview them a second time or a third time. You may have them meet other employees of the company in social settings, over dinner or in the boardroom during meetings. Dating should be very similar to that because what you're wanting to learn is who this person is. You're wanting to get past the representative, right? Because their representative is not who they are. Their representative is who they think you want them to be. 
So that's very important because they're filtering you and trying to adjust while you're filtering them. Mm -hmm. So we've got all this early filtering going on and we need to see them in different environments and then compare do they actually appear to be who they say that they are over time, right? Because people will tell you one thing, but their behavior can tell you something completely different. It takes time in order to see that. And the hard part is, unfortunately, not only do we often jump in bed too quickly, and the reason why the jumping in bed is important is because the moment that we bring sex in, all of those hormones flood our systems and it clouds our judgment. Again, we go back to being love drunk. I literally am intoxicated the moment that I have sex with you and I am not going to see you the same. So it's like going to bed at two with a 10 and then waking up at 10 with a two. What do you They're mean by that? I, don't... I mean, so... If I'm partying, I'm having a great time. By the time I go to the club and it's 2 a.m., the person that I'm leaving with in my drunken state, uh. in my high state, in my party state, they are a 10. <laughs> it's 2 in the morning. I'm feeling great. Everything is wonderful. I am going home with a 10, okay? Then at 10 in the morning, after all of those intoxicants have come out of my bloodstream and I'm sober and I roll over and I wake up with you and all of your makeup is on the pillowcase or all of my (laughs) face hair as the man is on the pillowcase and we've taken off all of the lashes and the nails and I get to see you, all of a sudden I'm like, whoa, who are you? You're a two. You are not a 10. You are a two. You are not somebody that I would have actually dated. So we need to be able to see that person with a clear eye and sex complicates that because it literally clouds our brain. It gives us a brain fog. So the longer that we can hold out on the sex, the more objective we can be about who the person is. Mm -hmm. That's important. The other part of this is we have to know that over time, time is what allows us to see a person in different situations. We can talk about theoretically whether or not we think we line up in a particular way, but having actual experiences where we're challenged to see who we are is totally different, which is why to go back to the starter marriage, I often tell folks, if you really want to know who somebody is, divorce them, right? Or break up with them. Many people learn way more about a person at the end of a relationship than they did in the entire relationship. So it is not about time that heals all wounds or creates something different, but what you do with that time. So therefore, it is also important in terms of compatibility, how we date a person. If every time we date, we just go out to dinner and a movie, we're not having any conversation. How do I know about you? How do I know about how you handle challenges? How do I know how you handle being caught off guard? How do I know how you handle social settings? How do I know how you treat other people? If we only date in places and spaces that never really show me who you are, but now when we're together, I'm not dating you to just have fun nights. I'm dating you in places and spaces that require the full range of you to show up. If we don't ever exercise that point of who we are until we're already married or until we've already moved in together or we've already created children or other kind of lifetime commitments that find us stuck together, we've created a whole set of problems for ourselves that now we may be resentful of. Now we may be frustrated with. Now we may become annoyed because I'm stuck with you in a different way and I'm gonna make different choices based upon those consequences that we've already created. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is communication. It's like knowing, that's so amazing that you guys were able to communicate. It's like mm-hmm. learning really good communication skills. It's is everything. A skill. And there's a certain way to, to learn how to, there's something called imago therapy, which I really what like. Is it? It's called imago, I am I M A G O. Okay. But there's different variations of it. But essentially, it's if you're in a relationship, you try to, the guy have to confront you about something using feeling words like, babe, you are never on time and you're always, you know, I'm always mad at you, 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 and you blame them. Because the second you put someone on the defensive and you say, you, you, they shut, they don't hear the next mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. you say. But when you're like, it made me feel really disrespected when you were late. Mm-hmm. And I just want, you know, I want you to know how I'm feeling and, and it doesn't feel good. And then, then they repent back to you. So what I'm hearing is that you said yeah. that you feel that, that me being late 
is what, what has upset you. And then I could say, yeah, that's what it is. And I, and I really don't want that to happen. Then your partner would say back, I hear what you're saying. And I'm sorry I've made you feel that way. Let me explain. I was running late. And then it's really just like a very specific, mm-hmm. I'm because no one can argue with your feelings. Mm-hmm. And repeating back and then saying it, I mean, it, it's, it's this beautiful process because really communication, I used to think I was a great communicator before I actually learned communication skills. What I meant was <laughs> I'm very sociable and I like yeah. people and I love talking, <laughs> right? Very, yeah, very different yeah. than being a good communicator yeah. or a good listener. All yeah. different. Yeah. I'm the life of the party. I don't know what the hell you said, but wasn't I fun? Yeah. But when you learn these things mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, okay, it's it's really good listening. It's it's re- re- reporting back in a relationship. It's not just being easygoing and cool, right. like all that. It's yeah. really specific. And so I think in a new relationship, it's important. Your partner might not have these skills, but if they are interested in learning, you could, you guys could learn it together. You mm-hmm. could learn how to be effective communicators. Mm-hmm. So I think that is huge and it helps you with every kind of relationship. Right. And you said something, um, you said, it made me feel disrespected yeah. Yeah. when you were late. But I feel like you could only feel disrespected if you disrespect yourself because well, it's right. already in there. Because why mm. would you be feel disrespected if someone was late? They were just late. It was yeah. traffic. They were working. They couldn't get off in time. But why, what inside right. of you made you Why'd feel you so it? disrespected? Yeah. Okay, exactly. So that goes back to the childhood. So let's say yes. my partner said back to me, I'm working so hard. You know that I would never disrespect for you to be late. I'm like, every time you're late, you're late every day. I have to disrespect. Well, that go back to, okay, well, where else do I feel this? Why do I always mm-hmm. feel like maybe people are yes. taking advantage of me in my life? You know, maybe it's them, maybe it's not. But I could, I could then I could say like, you're right, that way that wasn't disrespectful, but I've told you this, where else can I set boundaries around this? So maybe mm-hmm. then he's got to alter his behavior and realize that like time is an issue for me because in my past, then what therapy would do or friends would say, where do I feel disrespected? Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? My mom was always late. She never picked me up at school at time when some, I've got some mm-hmm. issues around time. It's always layers. You're peeling back, you're peeling yes. back. You're, no, you got to assume that if you're in a relationship or a friendship with someone that you love, they don't intentionally want to hurt you. Right. Yes. Maybe they're the biggest jerk in the world. And if you're they both do, you're it. with the wrong exactly. person. Exactly. <laughs> if they get off on that. Yes. But if they're truly like, babe, I did not want to be late. I swear. Then you know, like, okay, well, then how do we get to it? And then there's layers mm-hmm. and layers. And, and that's what my peeling. husband says to me. He's like, you know my intentions right. are true. So if I say something and I was wrong, you know my intentions are pure. And when he said that to me, I was like, you're right. He would never hurt me and he would never intentionally want to. And that's exactly, I love that so much because that's exactly what I do with Tom. I use the word feel. So I say, I know you love me. I know you didn't mean to, but I did feel disrespected during this. And then once you've identified, because what you're saying is look back in your life, Mm -hmm. see where else you've been, you felt disrespected. And so what I do is I even say that in that conversation. So I'll say, I've realized that I feel disrespected because this actually happened in my past. I know it's something I need to get over, but right now, this is what I'm working through because you're never going to be able to do it overnight. So I bring my partner in and say, I'm going to work on it. But for now, can you please not be late because it gives me this feeling. And on the side, I'm going to work on it. And eventually you can be as late as you like, and I'm not going to (laughs) care. But like giving yourself that, leeway to be honest with your partner about why you're insecure about why this has affected you bringing them into it so you can do it together as a partnership right. instead of in um, right. solitary that's such a good way to say mm-hmm. it because it and what what could happen if you don't have these skills and i love that we're all saying it takes time is that what happens and i don't this women do this too but in a male in a heterosexual relationship men typically want to fix which is what i hear from women every single day mm-hmm. they want i, I went to my partner like Oh my God, well, I want to fix it. Like, then you should just, you know, if they come home from work and I'm upset about something, well, well, let me help you. You should quit your job. You should, you shouldn't talk to this person. Let me get you food. You know? yes. Sometimes, like, let me clean, let me. No, yes. we just need you to listen. Mm-hmm. I need you to say, I hear that you're hurting. Mm-hmm. I hear that was a really rough day, babe. Tell mm-hmm. me more. And that's another, and we all need different things. Yes. yes. And I'm not saying yes. men don't need that, that as is well, really but true. teaching your partner how you need to be mm-hmm. loved. I love yes. that. How you need to be listen to what Mm -hmm. you need in these moments because everyone's different maybe their last partner wanted more fixing for example but a lot of times they for men it's a typical thing that they don't but let him know it's so funny because loved when you listen i used to get in arguments with tom because i would go to him with a problem i just want to hug i want his arms around me to say baby everything's okay and what he does he's like okay so what did you do but what did they do (laughs) okay so what did you do after and now i feel like i'm being interrogated so now we've learned what we do 
and it's become a habit now. It took us a while to get there, but what we do is now, when if I go to him with a problem, I'll either remember and say, babe, I just need you to listen yeah. right now. Yeah. Or if I forget, he'll stop me. He's like, wait, 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 before you go any further, do you want me to listen or to fix it? <laughs> and I'll right. be like, okay, that's a good question. Yeah. What do I need right now? I just, I need you to fix it. And he's like, all right, let's do this. Yes. You know, or whatever it is, but being open and telling yeah. him because that's so true. Understanding your partner. Yeah. yeah. I so much. It's true. And half the journey, I mean, so much of this is what do you need? What do you want? Mm -hmm. And figuring out what we want like, especially a big thing that I think can stop from self-love and all this stuff is, is being a pleaser. And so mm -hmm. you never think, much, when you're a pleaser often, you care about, you're taking care of everyone else mm -hmm. around you, you think our needs come second or let, don't ever come, come last. So think, knowing, like, what do I need in a relationship? And that's why I think it's so important to write down what feels good to you, what doesn't when you're looking for a partner, and then Absolutely. explaining it, what I need, and that it's okay to have needs. Mm -hmm. and it's okay to ask for mm -hmm. what you want. Yeah. It's a big learning lesson. I think step number one is recognizing and naming what you went through. Okay. Yes. So how did you name it? For me, it was abuse. It was gaslighting. It was manipulation. Um, it was uh, dealing with narcissism and playing on my emotions. And mm -hmm. I think we hear the word abuse, but we don't really understand it unless we, or understand that we are going through it unless we see what it looks like for others. Because a lot of times we mistaken love for abuse. We say that somebody treating us a certain way is a, a loving way, or it's, it's a way for them to discipline us in some way, when really it's abuse, but we don't have the word to put it onto what's going on with us. And so when I started researching things that I was going through, things that I was being told, I came across words like gaslighting. And I'm like, gaslighting? What does, what does, does, yeah, what does it mean? Because I heard you say it, but I didn't hear the explanation. Yeah, so gaslighting is when somebody distorts your own understanding of your own reality, when they try to change your story. So for example, imagine that somebody that you trust very much, this could be your partner, mm -hmm. um, tells you, you remind them of a certain thing they said to you and they say, I didn't say that. And because you trust them, you trust that they're telling the truth. So they make you question your own reality. Mm. So this didn't happen because it actually happened. This happened because you manufactured it in your brain. Mm -hmm. And so they play mind games on you. And um, when I think of gaslighting, I think I would go through moments where I would feel like I'm completely here, I understand what's going on, and then two seconds later I'm questioning, is it really what happened or is it what my brain is telling me happened? And so it's, it's, mm. it's incredibly destructive for a person and it's so hard to get out of. So. Step number one yeah. is naming it. Yeah. Because once you name mm -hmm. it, you, you're like, okay, now I can categorize everything that I'm going through and say this is where it falls under. This is what needs to be done moving forward. This is, this is what I need to stop allowing to happen. This is what I need to do about it in terms of raising your voice. Um, and this is what I will do moving forward in case this arises from the same person or from other people. That's the beginning point. Mm. Um, and then you get to seek help. So I, I still see a therapist to this day, not as intensely as I saw her before, but she said, I remember when you first came here, you were just so, like there was darkness over you mm. and you were so hopeless and didn't, see that you had any power within you to stop what's happening or to overcome all these powerful people who are trying to bring you down and here you are and the power that you had was that you shared your story and so that's where my healing began and at that point I had to talk about it and I had to understand how I got myself to a point where my whole self-worth and my whole image of who I was and understanding of who I was was in someone's hands, mm -hmm. just one person's hands. And so there was a lot of unlearning that had to happen. And there was a lot of reflecting on my earlier years that had to happen to understand 
what was it that um, the making of Nejwa, the making of mm. me, of, of the me that was in a position to be so vulnerable and to be so taken advantage of. And I learned through time that to separate the fact that I had been looking for a home, I had been looking for love, and to say that just because someone took advantage of those needs and of those dreams, it doesn't mean that something was wrong with me for wanting them. We all want love, Ooh, right? <laughs> no, you just gave me the chills there. <laughs> You have to draw that barrier because you blame yourself for wanting to be loved. You blame yourself for wanting to belong. You blame yourself for wanting to be relevant to someone when you shouldn't do that. Yeah. That's the most beautiful, pure thing to want to feel loved. And then somebody looking at you and saying, oh, she's vulnerable. I'm going to take advantage of that. And you have to separate those two things and say, actually, your choice to take advantage of my need for love is all on you. It's not my weight to carry. It's not my burden to carry. Okay, number one, a lack of emotional maturity. So what I have found is with men and women, we have not learned how to manage our emotions. And especially in today's society, it has become even more reactive. People get offended, they react. People see something, they react. There is no processing. There is no taking a step back. So now when you, when you act that way within a relationship, imagine your partner does something, you could interpret it wrong, you react, you now say something hurtful in that moment because you're mad. You don't really mean it, but that's how you felt in that moment. Now they're hurt by it. Now they're damaged. Now they retaliate. And then boom, the cycle goes from there. And, and what we have to understand is, especially within relationships where two people have a connection, this is the person who can hurt you the most and make you the happiest. That, that's the, the, the scary thing about it. It's like they have the power, in a sense, to crush you, but to make you feel like no other person can. And so I always say the person that a woman loves most has the least room for error. So like when you see relationships where a woman is constantly being mistreated, but she keeps going back to him and she says, well, because I love him. No, you don't love him. You have an unhealthy attachment to him. Your ability to continuously take that mistreatment and that toxic behavior and go back to him shows me it's not love. When we're loving someone and we're really into them, one little mistake can hurt like no other. And again, going back to the emotional maturity, if you don't learn how to not just react, how to communicate before we assume, before we come to our own conclusions, that can easily derail the relationship. So I definitely think a lack of uh, emotional maturity. I also think lack of healing. Lack of healing is going to always be uh, a thorn in the side of relationships. All right. Because again, sometimes our partners do things that trigger us, but that trigger stems from past trauma we haven't resolved. All right. And they're not even aware sometimes of what they did or how it's in, uh, impacting us. And so if we don't learn how to let go of our past traumas and issues and hurts, we run a high risk of things going left in that relationship, especially with someone we have a connection with. And like I said, the person you have a connection with, everything's magnified. So it's going to hit harder with them. So the third thing is unrealistic, unrealistic expectations of people and our partners. And what I mean by that is this idea of, it's like you said, uh, someone meets a connection, they think, okay, we're good now, we're going to succeed. No, 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 no. You're still two human beings. You are still two people who can fall short at any time, at any day. If we don't give grace to each other, we are going to have a big problem here. We've got to recognize the difference between the person who does not belong in our life and continues to do wrong and the person who does belong in our life but makes mistakes. Right. Okay? Yes. And, and so once we know, listen, we have a connection. I know that I want to go through the storms with you. You're the person I'm supposed to be with. Now let's remember that in our moment of struggle, because again, 
everyone's going to make a mistake. You're, you're going to do something, especially the longer you've been together, you're going to mess up some way, somehow. You may say something you shouldn't have. You may insult them in a way, you know, something, something. It happens, but there needs to be grace and understanding. We are human beings. We're going to fall short. We got to embrace that forgiveness always with our partner. And again, communicate. And that's the other thing. Communication would be the other pitfall. A lack of proper communication can derail any situation. And so you, you got to be willing and establish very early on a willingness and an, a, a safe space for both partners to be able to talk about anything. We should not have to hold on to how we're feeling with each other, because if we do, that is a recipe for disaster. I would say it should be one of the top pillars of your relationship. I would say prioritize your, listen, if you're a couple that prioritizes health and wellness, you can't have sex be the outlier of your health and wellness. And I think that's the problem. You were saying that it's interesting. Earlier when we talk about self-care, people don't think of it, but don't think of sex. But it's absolutely because you talk about the neurochemistry, you talk about the oxytocin, the cuddle hormone, like we require it. We need touch. We need connection with our partners. And so in telling you that, if you if you think about that, it's, it's part of being healthy overall, then I think you have to prioritize it. And sooner than later, even if you don't know what to do with it, just say, I'm not sure what to do about this either. I'm stressed out, I'm not, but let's problem solve together. I always hear from, like I said, one person in the relationship, but do it together. You both want it. I mean, I'm gonna say now that your partner wants to be a good lover to you. They're with you. They just might not know how because the house is a mess and they have a lot of responsibilities and they're stressed out. So it's just another thing you have to solve, like opening up a savings account or how are we going to be better parents? I just want people to think differently about their sex life. God, I, and you, as you were saying it, I was like, it's kind of like, you know how in the mornings when it's just like, I need to meditate and then I'll do this. Can you see a world where someone's like, I just need to masturbate and then yes, I'll do I this? Do. Lisa, I got you my meditate. <laughs> you did. I got her a masturbate, <laughs> meditate, manifest candle because that's me most mornings. I will do all those things. I will masturbate. I, I meditate every morning. I mean, don't, but again, I am not a saint. I mean, I am not perfect. Sometimes I'll have like go a few weeks and I'll be like, oh my God, like the pandemic, I'm home alone. Like, I'm not masturbating. And then I'm like, oh, and then whenever I have an orgasm, it's like, the cloud shift, I just, and I'm not saying this for everybody, but you're gonna notice a shift because orgasms are good for us. They actually help boost our immune system. They, they help with cramps, they help clear our skin, they help clarify our thoughts. I mean, it's like, it's, it's what do you gotta lose? I freaking love that girl. And it's so true, like the more we're talking, the more, like, you know, as you said about your candle, making it normal so that it becomes part of our self-care because then like if we do that i then think it will make it easier to start talking about more right. with our friends with our partners because like even just going through all the hard questions i was like i can talk to you about it now that i'm in my 40s confident been with my husband for 20 years but i'm like what about that person that's just starting out like how do we set them up for success or even someone right now now that may be in a relationship where let's say it's they've got some bed death and it's like, how the hell, Emily, do we start helping those people yes. to spark it alive? Yeah. Like, I, there's opportunities here. We just have to be honest this about what it. that is. Yeah. I mean, do some research or like research, read about sex, start to explore your own body and figure out what feels good to you. I mean, I, I learned a lot. I mean, I do have a doctorate in human sexuality. I went back to school, but what a lot of what I learned about my own body came from my own experimentation. It came from my own, like what, how might this feel? What, you know, we have so many nerve endings in our body. So just getting curious about sensations and what feels good to us. I just want people to know that it's, and I encourage you because it's really still shameful. Like you've been with someone, they're like, well, when is the, I bet you people are thinking, well, I've only been with someone for six months or only been with them for a month. Is it too soon? And I think as soon as you're having sex with somebody, it's time to start talking about it. Yeah, like, isn't there a quote? Like, if you can't talk about sex, then you shouldn't have be having sex. Yes, exactly. Exactly, and we will talk about everything with our partners. Literally, sometimes like you had a baby together, you sat and watched that baby come out of your wife's vagina. Like you, you birthed something, you have shared everything, you've been through the highs and lows, but you will not address your sex life. And it's just, I just want to turn that on its head. I want to take away the taboo and the shame. And I think that the more that you hear it and you realize that you just haven't been living in a world where it was safe and where it was comfortable, be that friend in your friend group. 
be that friend that talks about it. Say, hey, I know we never talked about this, but do you masturbate or what kind of orgasms do you have? I'd love to know. And, and I think you will find that people are going to be on board with the conversation. I found that most people want to talk about it. They just haven't felt safe or had mm -hmm. that person. Well, I think one of the hardest things in the world is, is self-awareness. Yeah. And I think self-awareness about where am I, where is what I'm asking for reasonable and where am I being but unreasonable? Got, oh, dude, I'm going to push you on that because no one says I'm being unreasonable. People don't actually think that about themselves. Or do you think that? No. Well, I, I try to really look at certain situations because I'm a very... To a, to a fault, probably self-reflective person. Mm -hmm. I overthink. That's my problem. I, I, you know, I'll say something in a conversation, and then I go away, and I go, "Should I have said that?" Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I kind of overstepped the mark there, mm -hmm. and I start, you know, like I can obsess if I'm not careful. So I've had to, like, I have to really mind my own obsessive qualities. What mm -hmm. makes me very good at my job? Yeah, I do. <laughs> is also my worst enemy Yeah, I was going to say, what is your superpower is also your kryptonite. For sure, because I'm good at seeing 10 steps, 20 steps mm -hmm. ahead. That's, that's like my gift. But I, when I try to be very aware of when I'm doing something, am I, am I being, is this me asking too much or is this me doing something is me, am I asking for something unreasonable here or is this reasonable? And I think a lot of people go through that in relationships, especially when they're with someone who's saying, you know, because a lot of people's initial defense is what you're asking for is, is unreasonable mm. or what you, I didn't do that. Like we, we all do it at times. We get defensive and our first port of call is to try and make the other person seem like they're overreacting mm -hmm. or it's very difficult, especially when someone's making us feel like we're overreacting, to get impartial and to say, where is the line between me asking too much and me asking for the right amount? Right. And, and sometimes I think people don't realize they're toxic because they're so convinced of their story. Right, that's what I was going to say. It's more like a frame of reference, right? So it's like my frame of reference is going to be very different from Tom's. It's going to be very different yeah. from yours, right? We just have different upbringings. And yeah. we've been told different things and we've encountered different things. We went to different schools, like all these things that encounter our, you know, build up yeah. and, and create our belief system. Then <laughs> comes to the, well, how do you know who is being reasonable and who's not? Because my frame of reference is I'm very reasonable. Yeah, of course. And Tom's frame of reference may be you're being so freaking unreasonable. Yeah. Um, so I how do you... I, I try to keep a record, not just of the times I was right, but I do try to keep a record of the times where I was so wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, where was I so utterly convinced of a thing? Mm -hmm. And then I came to someone and I was like, you know, oh, what, so blah, you didn't text me back because of this reason? And, they, and they're like, yeah, but I didn't even, my phone wasn't even on. Or mm -hmm. I didn't even, and I'm like... <laughs> Okay, like you have that moment of that, that realization where you go, oh man, what just happened in my mm. mind? Mm. Like, where did I just go? I think, I think it's important, not, not in a way of all, never, never trusting yourself, but just in the sense of being aware of how wrong you can be. And therefore, at the very least, mm. having allowed that to make the space for you, to at least go into a situation curious mm -hmm. about what their intentions were, about what may the way maybe a way that you're not bringing it up in the right way, or you know rushing too quickly to accusations or conclusions. At least allow your knowledge of how wrong you've been in the past mm -hmm. to create the space for you to be curious instead of rushing mm -hmm. to the end of the story already, and then be honest with. Uh, is this person, I'm, I'm being honest about ways that I want to bring my best to this and I want to be clear headed and I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But are they being a teammate in that? Mm. Or is everything, are all the concessions on my side? Is all the work somehow always about what I need to do? Is it never a joint effort? And I think sometimes that that's a giveaway that, you know, we've convinced ourselves we're the problem all the time, but you know, we're not, we're not getting, uh, well, they're not making life easy for us. But when we're the toxic one, mm -hmm. we're convinced that 
everything they've done is wrong and that we're justified in however we're acting. Yeah. And look, I, and, and my point is that sometimes we're in the wrong somehow. Like we need to address certain issues, but at the same time, life's not black and white. Sometimes you have your issues, but they're also not, they, they are feeding your anxiety in a certain way, or they are contributing in a certain way, or they're not being empathetic to certain things that you're feeling, or they're, you know, sometimes it's like if you take attachment styles, right? People talk about the, you know, the, there's the book Attached that goes through anxious, secure, and um, avoidant. The anxious attachment style uh, you know, typically we're worried about the end of the relationship, being abandoned, someone doesn't love us, we need reassurance. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're with someone that inflames your anxieties all the time, mm -hmm. that can be a problem. It doesn't mean you're not anxious and that you being anxious isn't a problem. It just means that you're also with someone who sends you to the extreme when it comes to those things. So I do, I think we have to be mindful of whether we're with someone that in a way that's not healthy inflames the worst parts of us because I do think the right relationship has a somewhat calming effect 